welcome welcome to ahimsa conversations and thank you so much for making time so harsh let's begin with your childhood what would be say your earliest recollection of either the concept or an experience of ahimsa or its opposite for some people it's the opposite it's it's hard to Hard to actually put a finger. Uh, I had an unusual um, childhood. Uh, my father was uh, a member of the civil service. It was just in the years after independence, um, and uh, Nehru uh, had been was very anxious about uh, the, you know how. Uh, what is now called Arunachal Pradesh, that was Nipa. Uh, it, it was an uh, area that hadn't been opened up. And he was very keen that it was done in a way that was uh, sensitive and responsible. And, uh, and so they created a special band, uh, you know, which is separate from the uh, Indian Administrative Service, and something called the Indian Frontier Administrative Service. And uh, uh, the uh, very well known anthropologist, Beria Elvin, uh, well known perhaps to an earlier generation. He and Nehru uh, directly mentored uh, uh, people. Uh, the officers so of my dad was one of those, and uh, he was posted in places like Bombila, where uh, apparently you had to trek over the mountains for a few four days. Uh, before uh, you could reach even the district headquarters where he was collector. Uh, there was no electricity, there was no running water, there were no shops, your rations used to be airdrop and we would go up on uh, on ponies or on the, you know, on uh, So Harsh, bag. this must be before you went to school. Uh, before I went to school, so my early childhood uh, uh, was was that. And so, but it was also very, you know, my parents would recall Bombila uh, as probably the happiest time of their lives where there was no electricity, water, and everything else. Because everyone used to gather uh, and, uh, you know, and sing old Hindi film songs and, and together, you know, the whole small community. So I have some memories of that. I have memories of the Dalai Lama. Uh, as one of my earliest memories. Yeah, I think um, Harsh, you should tell that whole story because you have to assume that the people watching and listening to this don't know about your connection with His Holiness. See, it was 59. I was four years old. Uh, and I'm never sure how much I remember and how much I am uh, I am told what happened. But my uh, the Dalai Lama was escaping from uh, from from China, and uh, my father was the district head of a place called Bombila, uh, which borders uh, Tibet, and uh, he was secretly informed uh, about this escape, and had to somehow organize. And remember, it was. 1959 and communication, etc. So there were very few people with Jawala Nehru and uh, a few others who knew. And uh, and so he organized uh, his uh, his escape. He, he met him at the borders and, and, and then brought him across. And the first place he actually halted for a few days was uh, at my parents' place. So he always talks of it about him as his first uh, friend in a sense in uh, after he came to India. Uh, then you know once he reached then of course the whole world knew uh, but but to that time. And so he spent those early days uh, in uh, in our home. Uh, and my mother apparently because everyone had to be very careful about things like even his food, uh, 
uh, you know, that shouldn't be poisoned and so on. So she was the first woman apparently who cooked for the Dalai Lama uh, in generations or something. And uh, and I apparently used to uh, be uh, a child of four, laying on his lap all the time. And uh, and everyone was anxious that apparently, but he used to say, no, I love having him you know, in this town. And even at that time, he was gentle. Uh, he had lost his kingdom. He had lost his home. Um, he, it was a huge trauma. But uh, he was gentle and kind. And uh, he felt, he used to say, even when he meets me now, for all these you know, 60 plus years later, uh, he still uh, remarks at uh, how much, uh, you know, that sense of closeness, uh, the sense of solace that he got. So I was fortunate, my parents were fortunate to uh, have him and he, uh, he and my father maintained uh, a bond uh, through uh, his entire life. Uh, now, Harsh, as a grown-up, uh... I think you've been very particularly attached to that song. Chal ke tujhe, main leke chalu, ek aise gagan ke tale. So can you can you convey for our English speaking friends what that song means and particularly what it means to you? Because I have a feeling that it's it's the core of your life. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very special song. Uh, yeah, for friends who, who are unfamiliar, uh, it, it's a song uh, in a film where uh, uh, this uh, young child has, you know, has been badly traumatized. His home, well his family, has been destroyed and, and, and killed. And his uh, and this one, uh, I think, brother or uncle, I forget. Is taking care of him, and he talks to him about taking him to a place. Uh, let me take you to a place uh, where there is only love. Uh, it's under the sky, uh, under such a sky where there is only love. Koi ghar na ho, koi bear na ho. No one is a stranger. No one is an enemy. Enemy. Everybody walks together. Uh, 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 under such a sky. Uh, it's always been a special song for me. Uh, and I think in, in more recent years, uh, for two reasons um, in particular. One of them is that in the last 20 plus years after I left the Indian civil service, when I came back to live in Delhi, um, I had resolved that I must work with the most disadvantaged uh, persons in wherever I, you know, right through my life. That's one of the things that I probably took from uh, Gandhi, uh, this learning of the last person. Uh, last person, not for charity, but for for a bond of what I call egalitarian compassion, uh, bringing us together. And I identified uh, you know, perhaps that last person was the homeless child in the city, uh, and that there are something between fifty to one hundred thousand of these children on our streets. We pass them every single day of our lives, uh, and uh, you know, on a cold winter night, for instance, you'd see a homeless girl who's sleeping uh, on a pavement alone. Uh, and you've come back. With your children um, from a film and a restaurant, and you go home, and your child will uh, be uh, kept in safety with love and nurturing. And this child is going to sleep alone under the, in the cold sky, under the cold sky. She perhaps be molested or raped in the night. She has to wake up at four in the morning uh, uh, to. Uh, you know, search in the in the waste dumps so she can uh, earn something to her, eat some food. She never see the inside of a school, and the distance, the physical distance between her child and your child or mine, 
maybe just a kilometer, but it's the longest distance in the world. And to that that bridge that I wanted to to somehow walk across. So that became an even an important part of my life, and we took care of of of, of the children in in many parts of the country. And this song seemed to be the song to sing for them. Uh, you know, come, let me take you to a place as under the sky where there is only love and love. And it became, it touched them so much that I, there is never a time where I could not meet them without singing this song for them every time. So it became almost an anthem. But, you know, in more recent years, it, it's gained yet a deeper deeper meaning for me because we are seeing our country and actually much of the world, uh, something's happened around our world that people in country after country around the world, more and more people are being attracted to leaders who are encouraging us to think. Uh, where to be a minority of any kind has become more and more dangerous. And when you see somebody who is, and, you know, and we're living in a world where the chances that the person next door to you may not look like you, may not uh, speak like you, may not worship like you, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so how do you respond to this person? So are you curious, friendly, welcoming, or, or are you, um, you know, fearful, resentful? Uh, angry, uh, and we are finding more and more people are getting attracted to leaders. And I'm not really, I'm not facing them. You know, my worry is not about the leaders. It's about how many of us are getting attracted to leaders who are teaching us to hate and to fear. Uh, and in this, in this new. India and the world that we are creating, which is founded around uh, the politics of hate and social relations of hate. Uh, again, this song, you know, at some level, it's very simple. Uh, and yet, when you think about it, it is so profound. Uh, let me take you to a place uh, under the sky uh, where there is only fire. Yeah. yeah. So, Harsh, it's ironic that, uh, you know, in the public discourse, uh, you're often seen in very partisan terms. And yet, the three issues that you have chosen to work on as an activist, hate, hunger, and homelessness, uh, are actually three things that are above and beyond all ideology. I mean, they are, they are related to very fundamental human and humane concerns. So, how do you find a nonviolent approach within yourself to engage with or to, in your perception of uh, those who may be, if not promoting, but allowing these three problems to persist? Um, and I'm here referring both to uh, Gandhiji and to Martin Luther King. You know, for example, King has repeatedly said that I cannot be liberated till the white man is liberated. Right. Because, yes, of course, the person being hated is suffering. But we know psychologically that the person doing the hating is also, is also afflicted. So how do you process this within yourself? And now I'm asking you really at a emotional and psychological level rather than, you know, in the in terms of the, the politics of it, which is a everyday thing. Yeah, I, I continue to be surprised when somebody calls me a hardliner. Uh, I have uh, I have nothing against people who are hardliners. Uh, but for somebody who fundamentally believes in a world that is just, that is kind, 
that is beautiful, where, you know, the idea of fraternity, uh, it's, it's a problematic word because it's brotherhood and we also are talking about sisterhood. Equally. So yes, I yes. prefer the Hindi word which is Bandhuta. Bandhutva. Bandhuta, actually. And Bandhuta is, is, is really one of those really beautiful words because it means uh, we are bound to and with each other. So, uh, what does this mean? It means that uh, that if they, as you were talking about, I the king, you know, the change in your feet uh, are also stealing my freedom. Uh, if you are being lashed on your back, I feel the pain on my. Uh, if you are suffering, there are tears that come to my eyes. Uh, you know, I, I often think that perhaps the deepest bond that human beings can have between each other is what I call a uh, a relationship of pain. The, your pain is, is something that I suffer with, suffer from. And, and my pain is something that you suffer from. That's what binds us together. So I'm, I'm speaking, fighting, struggling uh, my entire life, however imperfectly, uh, for a world that is that is built around one people. That is uh, that where we sh share uh, share what we have. Uh, where they, a sense of equal, equal opportunity, equal worth and dignity of human being, a sense of justice for all. All of these, I mean, uh, so, so it's odd at this time to be, uh, to be described for these views, uh, for these beliefs, for these struggles as a hard line. It only means, you know, when I look back to my college, I, you know, Many of us evolved politically. I I think I even my beliefs, but I I am basically was there. You know me from around that time. Uh, where I was, I, I logically uh, it's a, a humanist socialist. If you have to give it, humanist socialist feminist whatever, uh, it's something in, in that space. Uh, whereas. Uh, you know, when I was in college, I think a lot of people thought I, it was too soft a position, you know. Uh, and Because and why? It, because it was not ideological enough, perhaps. It was actually ideological. I mean, there was uh, an ideology that was, I think, not, not so clearly recognized. Uh, or so are you, are you seeing compassion itself as an ideology? See, I'm, I'm talking about Bandhuta as an ideology. In fact, you know, it is about okay. fraternity as an ideology. Because, you know, many people, but since you're talking in India, Dr. Baker, uh, who led the writing of our constitution, he said something very profound. He said many things that were profound. But he said that, you see, we listed justice, liberty, equality, fraternity as the foundations of our constitution. But he said that if out of these, then something uh, has to be the foundation of the foundation, it has to be fraternity. And why? He says because justice, liberty, equality are possible without fraternity. But you can only have, it, it, they are only possible without fraternity with the power of the state behind it. Behind it. But he says if there is fraternity, then justice, liberty, and equality become the natural order. Then you don't need a police force to, uh, you know, to, uh, to say, uh, and so, uh, anyway, so uh, uh, to say that there must be justice or to say that everyone must have equal rights and there has to be redistribution, etc. So, you know, to go back to what I was saying, so ideologically, I think there's a profound and, and, and a highly needed ideology around, in fact, the time for new imaginations of our world, which is truly founded on fraternity. I think we understand justice, liberty, equality, we may not practice them to some degree. But we don't even talk about fraternity and understand what it means. So anyway, that ideology 
is today being regarded as by many as hardline and radical. I have no problem with, with being hardline and radical, except that that means that there is a central space is which is problematic to me. I mean, what you are regarding as as moderate. If I am hardline, then what are you regarding as moderate? You know, and and, and so uh, there's something that is changing in our world. Um, I wrote a book. Uh, I'm not plugging for it here, but the title I just wanted to. It, it was called. It's called Looking Away, and the subtitle is Inequality. Prejudice, prejudice and indifference in New India. What I argue is that I'm deeply troubled by the inequality that we see around us in India and, and by our, the levels of our prejudice. But, but what troubles me much more is how indifferent we are. Uh, you know, our capacity to see deep injustice and suffering and to turn our faces away. And I would yeah. I would argue that the Indian middle and rich class, rich and middle classes, I've travelled around the world, uh, are probably um are probably the most uncaring, if not among the most uncaring that I've seen. You saw, for instance, during the lockdown. The lockdown was a moment where, you know, like Arundhati Roy uh, said somewhere, she said. Uh, COVID-19 was not just uh, a virus, it was also an X-ray. An X-ray that revealed very, very clearly, starkly who we are. And what did we see during that time? We saw, I mean, we, I mean the way we first, you know, the government announces a policy where it, it, it says say stay at home, social distance. 60% of Indians live in one room or less. How are they going to stay? At home and keep social distance. I mean, Mr. People, you, you work from home. Nine out of ten workers are informal workers who have to earn each day. Yeah. Wash your hands. I mean, so, so I'm saying that in the middle class, we should have felt an outrage that how can you have a policy in a country like ours where there's so much poverty and inequality and informal work? And yet we were not. We were happy. Uh, we celebrated. Yeah. So it is that indifference. Uh, yeah. uh, Harsh, somewhere. Can I just say one thing? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. He said, he said he's a Holocaust survivor. He said the opposite of love is, uh, uh, is not hate. Uh, the opposite of love is indifference. Sorry, who said this? Ellie Wiesel. He's a ah, Holocaust Ellie survivor. Wiesel. Ah, yeah, yeah. He's... The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is... Uh, is is indifference, and it is this that I feel we need to battle. It is this that led me to these three agendas that I spoke. You spoke about rightly. Uh, the in, you know, inequality at its extreme, leading to people who, uh, you know, well, I I still recall group uh, of Masahar Dalit women who said the most difficult lesson of all that they had to teach their children. Is the lesson of how to sleep and breathe, uh, and you know to have a have a to live in a time when we have seventy million tons of grain in our warehouses. You put it in a line, you can go from the earth to the moon and come back. Yet every second child, every third child is man love. People have mothers have to teach, you know, or living in a city where every day you see that child who is sleeping under the open sky, women who who, who are raped. On a regular basis, because they don't have a home, and the hate um, that is targeting, yeah. you know, yeah. these that that drive my life. Uh, I know, Harsh. And, but and see, Harsh. So uh, let me just seek a clarification. So clearly, for you, nonviolence is compassion. It's it's egalitarian and, compassion. It's egalitarian. Okay. Compassion. And just make one quick difference. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Explain that. See, one kind of compassion is that uh, I am here, you are here, and you are the recipient of my compassion. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about two equal people meeting. 
Uh, just that when I meet you at this moment, I acknowledge that you have suffered greatly, and you are in great pain and loss. And so I reach out to you. But I acknowledge, as I do it, that a day can come when I will be suffering and in great loss, and you will have, you will reach out to me. That is egalitarian. And in that sense, it is very much. I mean, it is, yeah. it is that compassion. That's very profound. Because then in this, there is no um, superiority and inferiority involved. Absolutely not. I mean, it has yeah. to be the idea that that we are all of equal dignity and equal worth. I mean, this word equality is, is often spoken about. And somebody says, how are we equal? Obviously, yeah. you know, two of us get together. I mean, somebody can produce a baby, somebody cannot, somebody can... You know, is, no, uh, it's not yeah. about equality in that sense. I'm sure we have equal worth and yeah. equal dignity, and 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 I think it is that recognition of the equal dignity and worth of every human being. Yeah, but Harsh, there's a problem here, which is mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of what you have described is due to the structural violence of the macroeconomic system, and also, of course the uh, many structural uh, forms of uh, 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 what shall we say anti fraternity mm -hmm. now most people uh, have a psyche and a whatever mental emotional uh, level of uh, capability and strength that they can only handle so much direct exposure to unspeakable suffering. So what I'm suggesting, I'm not making a claim, but I'm wondering aloud that what sometimes seems like indifference is a person in a sense sort of withdrawing into themselves because they don't know what to do. And they don't know how to make a difference in the face of this magnitude of you know, structural injustice. So I'm wondering if there, how do you resolve this, um, in a sense, need for compassion towards those who appear indifferent? Is that an issue? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I, I think a lot about, about this question. Uh, and what is it that we are these? See, firstly, neoliberalism, uh, the economic model, to my mind, is as much a, you know a, a policy arrangement and arrangement and imagination of how the economy should be structured, as much as it is a moral framework yes. for our life. I mean, ultimately, neoliberalism about the you know the, the moral basis of neoliberalism is that greed is good. That I need to think only about myself. I am, you know, you, you and I are about the same age. You, we all remember our childhoods. How you might have lived in privileged families, but your mother would say, you know, don't waste food. There are hungry children outside. It was considered immodest to, I mean, yeah, uh, vulgar. I mean, to have a 27 story house for a family of four people, but, you know, in a city where uh, half the city is living in, in, in informal slum settlements would have been considered terribly vulgar. Today it is not. It's considered, wow, so glamorous. You know, there's something that has changed. I think we have been taught uh, and raised uh, uh, to, to valorize uh, selfishness. Uh, and, and it is not how we naturally are. And this is something I wanted to write with. We don't have the time, but because I work with homeless children, I often think about when we go down in a in a car when you take your small child and she's just about being able to make sense of the world. Every child, every child, when she sees another child her age, you know, begging on the street, under uh, you know, getting wet in the rain, etc., she feels distress. What do we teach her? We teach her. Don't care. We teach her indifference. You know, I don't think that is how we are. 
we have to nurture our capacities to care. Now, uh, the distress that it will bring us, yes, to some extent, but some of us would, you know, ready ourselves to, uh, you know, to, to, to withstand a lot of that distress, some of us less. But there's something that actually Prophet Muhammad said, and uh, I, 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 I like that a lot. I mean, I might answer your question a bit. He said, what is your duty as, as a good human being when you witness great suffering and injustice? He says, at the very least, respond from your heart. Sorry, at, at the very least? Respond from your heart. It means care. Then he says, some of us are, you know, are stronger and better. We respond with our tongues. We speak out against the injustice. A very small number respond with their hands. It means they act against the injustice. I'm not, I'm not expecting or asking or demanding that the world sets about you know, uh, everybody responding with their hands. It's not going to happen. It might be quite a boring world as well. I mean, there'll be different kinds of people responding. But yeah. what I do want to see a world is that everybody, everybody learns to respond with their hearts. So at least you feel badly when, when you hear about a Dalit girl being gang raped, you think of your own child. When you see somebody hungry, you think of, you know, what would you be as a parent not being able to feed your child? When you, you know, it is, it is this, when you see a, a Muslim man being lynched, you think of your own brother or your father and you feel the pain. I'm saying that that is all, if, we, if enough of us cared, we would be a much better society. So, Harsh, in the same way that you quoted other people, where does Gandhi appear or, or you know, influence you in terms of your uh, commitment to uh, non-violence? Gandhi, uh, Gandhi influences me profoundly. Uh, uh, there are things that I disagree with, it was views on caste, for instance, and so on. But, you know, when I look back, there are moments, I look back at India in 1947, think of a moment where one million people, Hindu, Muslim, Sikhs, have slaughtered each other in an unending round of slaughter uh, in religious hatred. One million people. Think of uh, a line that has been arbitrarily drawn, uh, dividing one country into two, and people being displaced based on their religious identity in the midst of the slaughter, including my own family, who are actually in what is now Pakistan. 15 million people were displaced, the largest distress, distress movement of human beings, apart from the movement of uh, uh, people for slavery from Africa, that human history has ever seen. Now think of that moment and then think of, and, and a new country has been constituted on the basis of religious identity in Islam. Rivers of blood are flowing, train loads are coming in both directions with everybody full of corpses. In the middle of this, you know, hatred, you know, one might say it was natural to have anger against the other community and to say they have got Pakistan as Muslims, so India will be a country for Hindus. You know, it was at that time, and I feel an immense sense of gratitude actually every day when I'm seeing now that we had a leader who could bring out our best selves at this moment. And he said, no, this is going to be a country for people of every faith, every language, every identity. It's a home equally for its Muslim uh, citizens uh, and will always be. And you know, there are many stories told about him. I'll just mention a couple. It was... Uh, uh, Kidwai, uh, her husband had got killed in the riots and had come as a widow to Gandhi and she recalls that she found him in great distress. This was just a month, uh, you know, months before he was finally assassinated and she said, um, uh, you know, 
He said, my work will not, will not be done until a Muslim child cannot play and walk without fear in this, uh, in this city of mine, which is really, my work is not done. And look at uh, what we brought our country to and our city to. Uh, in in uh, Calcutta, when, you know, when India was celebrating her first freedom, he was there trying, he went on this long fast. And the story is told about you know, a, a very angry Hindu man coming to him and, and saying, you know, what are you doing? You can't understand my pain. My little son this morning was, was killed by Muslim mobs. And he says, I understand your pain, but one, I'll tell you the way to, out of it where, you know, find a, find a Muslim child this small, adopt him as your own son and, and raise him in his own faith. You know, we had a leader who, who, who taught us and, and the majority of Indians supported and followed him. Uh, I can tell you many more stories, uh, but we don't have the time. So that is, uh, to me, in my mind, you know, non-violence seems a sort of not something. It's actually something much more than not something. It is the capacity uh, to not hate and to love and to, uh, you know, in, in, in the words, his last fast, you know, one of its demands, I mean, two, two weeks before he, he, he was assassinated, you know, when the refugees had come here in such large numbers in this very city, Delhi, where I'm speaking to you from, uh, one of the things that people had done was, you know, they said no mosques will be allowed, no dargahs, and they had put Hindu idols in all of these. And one his last, you know, pass, this was one of the most important demands and that that we must return these places. You know, we must, uh, you know, no true place of worship can be built around the hatred of and desecration of another. And so with all respect, we must return the mosque and the dargahs, including, in fact, the Mehruri Dargah today. Yeah. Uh, and it was, they say that, you know, even his closest uh, allies like Nehru and Patel and Mona Raza said, there's too much hatred, don't do this at this time. He said, this is the only time I must do it. And the first day they said there were 10,000 people in his support. By the fifth day, 100,000 people were on the streets supporting his demand. And and that is why we still have an India that, that I... Uh, that I can feel the uh, route to belong to, uh, and, and and that is what non-violence is for me. I spent many years in Gujarat. I, I I left the civil service. I worked for years and years among the victims, survivors. I relocated there for almost a year. Uh, you know, walking from village to village. I would say one thing that helped me survive that period. The horrors that I saw was that I can could give a challenge that for every act of brutality, I will find you three acts of kindness and courage in the same in the same location. So many people saved life under extraordinary circumstances. And you know, when I often say that is the story of Gujarat. You know, why don't we talk, talk about that story of Gujarat? Every year when we used to uh, uh, commemorate uh, what happened on uh, 28th uh, February. I would always invite, we would commemorate it by honoring those who saved lives. And and, and it was something that we saw. You know, that, that has been true. I went now on the journey of the Karwani Mahabharat. And so I'm not talking, uh, you know, it's not what I would want to say here. Or anywhere. We went, we made a resolve that we will go to the home of every person who has suffered from hate violence. We made about 30 journeys to more than 100 families and far more than We said we do four things. A, we, we, we will uh, say that you can say that you're not alone, you share your pain. B, we seek forgiveness for what we have become as a country, as a people. C, we assure you that we'll stand with you as you rebuild the broken pieces of your life and fight for justice. And we will tell your story. We'll make sure that the story is not erased. Now, through those journeys, I kept longing. I would keep looking. Somebody would have saved me. Somebody killed. 
somebody is stopped. And what has what is troubling me about what is happening in India today is that I could not find those words. All of us on these journeys, we kept asking, you know, please tell us about the person who stopped the crowd, somebody who and these stories which I have heard, I've handled riots for years. Uh, this is something is happening. There's a certain radicalization that is unfolding in our midst. And we have to recognize the dangers of that. People would tell us, you know, families would tell us, you know, I, 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 I wish, I wish they just shot him. I wish they just stabbed him. No, why did they torture him so much? Why did they gouge out his eyes? Why did they smash his genitals? Rajini, I want you to recognize that something of great evil is unfolding across our life. You know, and 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 and, and the silences are of many kinds. Just to take the uh, you know, just the Ramzan period, just a few uh, all, every day we are reading that in Greater Noida, the high-rise buildings, in Ramzan, uh, people gather because that was when the Quran was revealed. People sit together and listen to recitals of, of, of the Quran. It's not even with a loudspeaker. Over and over again, you have 50 people gathering, 100 people gathering and saying, we won't allow you to recite the, uh, recite the Quran. Okay, it's a, it's a group of 50 people. There are 3,500 flats in that, in that locality. Why could not, not anyone come out and say, why can't they, they, they recite their prayers? The Navratri songs are going on. Nobody, so that is there. Having said that, I will just say one more thing to contradict myself. At the worst of it, we are still finding, you know, when the namaz uh, was being stopped in, in, in Gurgaon, you know, you did have, even today, you had somebody saying, what's the problem? You're not allowing them to, uh, to pray. Uh, I'll stop my factory, uh, empty out my factory floor for two hours on Friday afternoon. You come and pray here. Come on to our terraces. The Sikh said, come into our gurdwaras. That is still, you know, we are still surviving as a society. That is still the story, but it is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. There is a hot winds of hate that are sweeping across our land, taking more and more of us in their grip. We must acknowledge it. We must still retain and call out for our capacities of goodness. There is a very important need for acknowledgement of the wrong that has happened to me. I, I'm, I've learned, I mean, I, I've thought a lot about, I mean, this is after years in Gujarat, you know, what will lead to healing? And I made a fourfold step. The first is acknowledged. The second is remorse. That I publicly am sorry for what has happened. The third is reparation. Having acknowledged and having the sense of, of deep remorse, we will collectively join hands to help rebuild your life. And the fourth is justice. See, and acknowledgement uh, that I found repeatedly is the beginning. And, and, and you know, as, as a Dalit, I mean, again, uh, I, I so got to say, I should have said it, but yeah, I'm not of, of, of Dalit identity. But you know, for uh, if you're living in a time even today where to wear a moustache, you're being killed. Uh, where a teenage girl, I mean, this teenage girl is, is, is gang raped and killed. We don't come out in, we come out when Jyoti Singh Pandey is, uh, is, is gang raped. We don't come out for the girl in, in Unnan. There is not that same uh, outrage. We are okay when Bilkis Banu's uh, rapists rip, uh, and killers are given. So there is a question of an identity which is being oppressed. And that identity, that has to be acknowledged. It should not end there. That is true. It should not end there. But there, it has to start with acknowledgement and remorse. 
uh, I I am very very convinced. Of course, we want. I I would love to go into a casteless India, but the casteless India is not going to happen by my not acknowledging that Dalits are suffering and have suffered injustice for for centuries. It is from for for starting with myself and erasing my caste identity from a position of privilege. So Jay Prakash Narayan had made a call when I was a younger person uh, for us to uh, eliminate, I mean, to remove that part of our name which indicates our caste identity. So my name is actually Harshmanda Singh. And even when I got into the IES, I was still Harshmanda Singh. Singh indicated both my religious identity and my caste identity. I decided at that stage that I am going to remove Singh from my name. It was a long, complicated process. One, I, mean, I had to I read the Gazette and a long process, etc. But I had a middle name, Mandar, which has no caste uh, and religious identity. And so I'm Harshmandar. And I gave my daughter an Arabic name. Surur to add to the confusion, but I can do that because I I must give up my identities that give me privilege. Don't ask me to deny those identities that have caused people injustice. Let them reach a point when they don't need to assert that. So thank you so thank much, you, Harsh. Um, thank you for uh, yeah. you know making the time and and being part of this.